Let's turn to the book of Acts, chapter 19. The book of Acts, chapter 19. We want to welcome you all here. Visitors, thank you for being with us today. Usually we're a little bit more uh, awake. I'm going to practice this. Everybody ready? Okay. Don't go to sleep on me. I'm not going to have you here that long. By the way, I need to say happy birthday, Jack Jack. Grandpa loves you. You little rascal, you. Amen. We don't worry about the terrible twos. He started at three months. <laughs> nah, he's a good kid. Should I have Zane come up here since it's his birthday and read this? Amen. No? Okay. Okay, we've had an exciting morning already. Zane, he just won't, won't settle down. But uh, over in the book of Acts chapter 19, <clears throat> verse 20. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Father, now open our hearts. Don't let anything, I pray, come between us and your word. Let us have an open heart to receive your word and grow by receiving your word. I thank you for the many visitors we have today. I pray for those who are away and sick. Father, bless this, your time. Let us see souls saved and Christians' hearts revived. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to say hello to Karina and Josh and Caitlin and Nate and Caleb. They're faithful about watching us, and they're clear out on the East Coast, and, and you know this preacher loves you, your family, families. Acts chapter 19, verse 20. Now, the book of Acts is a wonderful study of the struggle of the early church. <clears throat> you say, well, our churches are struggling today. Churches have always struggled against the things of, of the devil and things of the world. It gives us facts in the book of Acts that are worthy to be considered because, my friends, we still got to keep on keeping on. We still got to keep on moving for the Lord. We still got to keep on winning people to Jesus because Jesus is coming again. How many believe Jesus is coming again? Now, we might not know when or or, uh, uh, the time period of it. The Bible says, and Jesus spoke these words, only his Father in heaven, our Father in heaven, knows the day or the hour. But we need to, as I said before, we need to keep on keeping on until he comes and gets us. There are... There, in the days of the early church, there were many kinds of religions and theologies. Many. Many. There there was Judaism and also there was uh, uh, every kind of statue, stone, wood there was to offer. They did it. But the church started. You understand that the church took a lot of abuse from the Jews to begin with. The Jewish leadership hated God, although they said they worshipped him. But Jesus Christ, they, of anybody should know the scriptures, would know that Jesus is the promised Messiah. But they were going to lose their power. And there's nothing more frightening than people having power that crave power. Amen. That's a scary thought. And so in verse 13, you'll find out that many of the Jews were giving them fits. Well, even before that, in verse 9, uh, they were spe- starting to speak evil of the things of God. And, and it went to the point where the disciples uh, uh, left. And so they, they came into a, a other places in Asia and... And uh, they, they preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and we know that, that with this, uh, they brought people in and the people were healed because they didn't have the word of God to present people like we have today. And so God gave them gave him, uh, the, the uh, miracles of healing. You say, D- are people healed today? Yes, but it's God. It is God. I can't lay my hands on you and heal you, nor can anybody else, but God heals 
Uh, he's, I've had people say, uh, been uh, uh, told that they were going to die and they lived nine years, you know. And so God's hand's still on that. People who had cancer don't have it anymore. That's God. God still heals. Well, anyway, uh, they, were, they were coming and, and uh, they were able to cast out evil spirits. And we still have e- evil spirits today. But the early church, the unsaved Jews saw that something was happening with the early church. And I want to say this. I want this happening in our church. I want people to know that Bible Baptist Church is here not just to be known as Bible Baptist Church, but be known as a church of our living God. Amen? And people need to know in Enid that we are alive. We are, we are moving, and, and nobody's forgotten. Nobody's ever been forgotten in this church. We go to all peoples of Enid. Amen? Amen. And so uh, the unsaved saw the, saw the greatness of the church because Jesus started it. It was built on the foundation of Jesus, not Peter, but Jesus. And, and they saw great. So what they started to do is they started copycatting uh, the, uh, the early church. But in doing so, they didn't have the power of God. They were doing it of themselves. And we see what happens to these Jewish people. He says, Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons... A Siva, uh, Sikva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did also. And the evil spirits answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped upon them overcame them and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this was known to all the Jews and the Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus. And fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also which, uh, which used curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all the men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. My friends, this is the power of this blessed book right here. It is always going to grow and prevail if we, God's children, will crack the book open and start sharing it with people. You can never talk too much about preaching God's word and sharing God's word. You can't ever tell people too often how important the Word of God is. This book is so important that each person ought to have one in their house. That each person doesn't put it on the coffee table and leave it there till the next church service, but get that Bible and start reading it. You say, but I don't understand what I'm reading. You have people around here who will share with you the Word of God, and help to explain it to you. I spend most of my week opening up the Bible and sharing the explanation. And we don't interpret it ourselves. We let the Bible interpret itself. Amen? That's where we have problems. And so uh, uh, with this, they were trying to be like the church, but it backfired on them. And I want to tell you something. If you're here this morning and you don't have Jesus in your heart. Now listen. There's nothing more important in this world today than you know for sure Jesus lives in your heart. You say, preacher, I've got my whole hot life ahead of you. Yeah, but it depends on what hole is. Is tomorrow the rest of your life? Is it finished? We don't know. We don't know. I went, I've gone to several funerals and I've preached several funerals these last few weeks. Not all of them was knowing that they were going to die. But they did pass from this life. When the lost try to mimic Christians, it's mocking God. And those kind of people are in a bad time waiting on them. 
The first thing we need to understand this morning is that in the early days of the church, the gospel did not have an open field. They didn't. Today, our field is open. There's not a place in our city that I can't go out and start knocking doors. You say, but preacher, you might not be received. I might not be received, but I have that privilege of going out and knocking doors. I hate this ring. Do you guys like that ring? You say, well, I do at my house. Man, because when someone comes up to my door and ding-dongs, they can see whether or not Avon's calling. Amen. And they, they sit in there and they say, oh, those are church people, so I won't answer my door. Let me tell you something. That's a testimony to that house, whether they answer or not. Amen. And so uh, answer your door when church comes, especially Bible Baptist Church. Amen. So the church lived in an age and among people who were possessed with bitter and contrary views to the point that they would literally kill Christians. Do you understand that we live in such a blessed life? These people did it even though they knew their life was going to be taken from them. I'm telling you today, most of the time, I'm not going to say in every instance because you never know what happens. There's always some sort of nut out there. But do you realize we have the privilege of just sharing God? We go out to a restaurant, I get to share Jesus. We go out to fill up a, a, a car, my cars and stuff like that. And uh, first of all, we go to the bank and get a bank loan. But uh, we go out there and fill the car up. And if there's someone filling the car up next to me, I have that privilege to talk to them. Amen. And most of the time, they talk back. Most of the time, they're open to the, to the invitation of talking to them about their soul. Back in those days, to, to be a Christian and to live a, a, in a Christian life, it almost seemed impossible. How would you like to lose your home because you are a Christian? How would you like not to be able to buy groceries because you're a Christian? How would you like not to be able to buy the oils and stuff you need to cook with if you were a Christian? But yet this is what this church, the early church, went through every day of their life. And we, we have it so easy. It's easy to be a Christian today. You say, it's hard. It's not. We're making it hard. One of these days, it could get hard. We better take advantage of the time that God's given us. Say, preacher, we've, we hear this all the time. But I can't tell you enough how important for us to get off the chair and do nothing and start doing something. Again, let me remind you, Jesus is coming again. Do you want to be caught doing nothing for God or do you want to be caught living for Him? I think the latter would be the best. Even though of all the, the adversaries that the church had, the Bible tells us the gospel gained footing. This book gained footing. The, the preaching of the Lord Jesus Christ gained footing. You say, but, but the word of God, the gospel is not, is not accepted like it used to be. But you keep putting it out there and I'm going to tell you it's going to gain footing. First of all, it'll gain footing in your life because you're going to trust that God's going to use you to share the gospel. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I wonder if we did ask, I wonder how many people would have to raise their hand and say, Preacher, I, 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 I could be doing a lot more for God, and I'm not. You say, well, I don't feel guilty about it until I come to church. Hey, we ought to feel guilty about it every day, amen? And so he says, in spite of all that, it gained, it gained footing. It, 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 it took hold, and it changed people's life. Oh, yeah, the, the, uh, the opposition's there and, and the enemy looked down on the gospel. But you know, they're all dead and gone and the gospel's still here. My friends, we have that blessed responsibility. I'll say it a hundred times. You're going to hear this a lot from me in these next few months. We have that blessed responsibility. You know, old Paul, he was a narrow preacher. A lot of people say, well, that narrow-minded preacher, we need more narrow-minded preachers. 
We need more narrow preaching preachers. We need some preachers that will get up and tell us what the Bible says and then expect the people to obey God's Word. We do. We got in this mess because preachers won't be the preachers God called them to be. They're afraid to offend a church member. Now let me tell you something, church. I've always been this way and I've been straight up with you. I don't want to offend you. But I don't want to offend God more than I don't want to offend you. And if you're offended, and if I'm offended by the preaching of God's word, it's not the preacher's fault. It's our own fault. And we need to get it taken care of. We need young mamas and daddies to get on the road of salvation and then live for Christ. We need mamas and daddies that, that want a Christian home and to raise their kids up in, into the Christian faith. We don't need moms and dads say, well, uh, uh, here's a church here, but, but the kids can't play or the kids don't go to the gym and play while I'm in church. Those kids don't need to be playing in gym. They need to be listening to the Word of God. Amen. We have people say, well, we love your church, but our kids can't, don't have a playtime at church. Well, you play after church. And why is your children deciding where you're going to go to church? Amen? You're the parent. Be a blessing to them. Bring them to church that they don't play, but they pray. That they don't play, but they learn the Word of God. Say, well, they'll, they'll shut their ears. You can shut your ears all you want, but the Holy Spirit will take the Word of God. And He'll penetrate those dull of hearing ears. And bring them to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Young parents, you realize in your house you might have the next greatest preacher. In your house you may have the next greatest missionary. In your house you may have the next greatest teacher of children. This is in your house. This is the possibility. Are you giving them that? Well, I want my, my child to be president. Oh, Lord have mercy. Well, I want my, doc, uh, my, my daughter or my, uh, my son to be a doctor. We need Christian doctors. But what we need more is Christians. And daddies and mamas, I'm telling you, as much as you want them to learn in school and as much as you want them to succeed in life, they're not going to succeed to their full potential until they take Jesus and follow him. Oh, Chris and Destiny's got another baby coming. You know what's, what's so wonderful about this? And I told him today, what's wonderful about this? That this child, before it's even born, has got a mom and daddy that love the Lord and wants that child to be raised up in the fear of God. How about it, parent? You say, well, I do, I do. But what are you doing to... to uh, make that thing happen. He says, well, it puts me out. Sometimes we need to be put out. Amen. But Paul was a narrow preacher. He saw only one remedy for the ills of the people. As you look at this world today, you see the turmoil. Man, good night, nurse. You see the frustration. You see the anger. State governments are falling apart. We were talking, Brother Zach and I, we were talking. People fight just to fight nowadays. Where is the joy of life in that? Can you imagine the energy that is in the, the House of Congresses, the Senate and Congress? Don't you know that is just raw, negative, fighting and biting each other? But I tell you what, what Paul knew. He knew the remedy to the illness of the people. And what is the illness of the people? Sin. And he knew the remedy for it. And that remedy was Jesus Christ. The salvation of mankind. Now, salvation of mankind's just been offered by, by environment and education and everything like that. And I'm, I, we're going to have, we're gonna have a, 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 what do they call those things? We're going to have a retreat 
and we're going to change the environment, and it's good to change environment. There should be a different environment here than there is outside. Amen? Amen. And well, we'll just do it with the environment. Hey, I've seen get people get saved in the worst environment that there ever could be. Can't wait for environment. Can't wait for this and wait for that. I'm telling you, salvation needs to be today. Amen? Amen. And the environment will change. The knowledge will change. Oh, how people try to do it their way. But Paul knew that you could only preach the gospel. And that preaching the gospel, mankind would be saved. And that salvation would only come through Jesus Christ. Would you join me just for a moment in the book of Galatians? The book of Galatians chapter 1. I'm going to give you a couple of seconds to get there. Right after Corinthians is Galatians. In Galatians chapter 1, the Bible tells us in verse 4, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and of our Father. God did this. And Paul told the Galatians, he says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Even back then they're fighting the same thing that we fight today. He says, man, you came to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. You're following him. And another teaching came. And you were so easily swayed and removed. My friends, we don't need to be swayed or removed from God and his teaching. And he says, they call it another gospel. But he says, it's not another gospel. He said in verse 8, but though we, he started himself, though we or an angel from heaven, God be careful because who was an angel from heaven that fell? Satan. And he was a liar and deceiver. Amen. He said, or... Or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach another gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Now remember, he included himself in it. Don't accept any other gospel but the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, for do I now persuade man or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. He says this, who am I trying to please? Mankind? I'm telling you what, if I try to please you, I'm not the proper servant of God. Because if somebody's trying to please man, they're not going to call out sin and say sin is sin. My friends, whether I call it out or not, or another preacher calls it out or not, sin is still sin. We, we, the Bible declares, he says, at, at some point they're going to call good bad and bad good. Well, my friends, we're there. We, how many agree we're there? We are there. But whether mankind calls good bad and bad good, it doesn't change the fact. God determines what's good and bad. And we've got to go to Him. Young couples, please listen to me. You're raising your young family. They need you to follow Jesus. You grandmas and grandpas... Maybe you're a new Christian. You're older kids that have kids. They need you to follow Jesus. They need to see a change in grandma and grandpa's life. They need to know Jesus died for them. He says, but I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. 
He says, let it be known, let it be certified. When I preached to you the word of God, it didn't come after man. It came after God. And my friends today, let me tell you something. The salvation that we preach here at Bible Baptist is not the the salvation of the Baptist. It's not the salvation of the, the Presbyterians or the Lutheranians or the Substitarians and all the other Terrians. It's not of the Pentecostals, the Nazarenes, the Episcopals, the non-denominationists, the interdenominationists, and the dot-coms. The gospel we preach to you today is from the living God, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in the book of Matthew that broad is the way to destruction. Narrow is the way to heaven. Amen. It's so narrow. Jesus said of himself, it's through him and him alone that salvation will be obtained. He says, for I neither received it, the gospel, I never received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of God. Over in the book of 1 Corinthians, would you please join me? And I'm almost finished for this morning. Over in the book of 1 Corinthians. You say, preacher, this sounds a whole lot like what we've been hearing. And again, it's the same but different. I want to... Just to put it in your heart that you truly understand why God left us here, Christians. And that's to win people to Jesus. And to see those people that are wanting Jesus to grow in the Lord. Chris, I, I'm picking on you. You're down here close. You got saved. But you just didn't get saved. You started growing in the Lord. Isn't that right? You started trying to better yourself. Destiny's over here in the, in the nursery over here because she doesn't want to get sick because she's going to have a baby this week. But she's here. She'll tell you, I got saved, but she just didn't get saved. She wanted to better herself. Isn't that right? I see her shaking her head. They wanted to grow. I just don't want to be saved. I want to be a knowledgeable child of God. I want to be able to bring somebody to Jesus. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom. Now, this is your preacher smack dab out. I don't know those $5 words. If you use a $5 word on me, if you use a $2.50 word, if you use a dollar word on me, I'm probably going to have to go to dictionary.com. Paul was a very intelligent man, well-versed in wisdom. Paul says, you know, I didn't come to you with fancy speech or flaunting my wisdom. He says, I came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. My friends today, listen, please listen to me. I'm closing. Please listen to me today. I'm not going to try to put up some fancy signs or do some fancy PowerPoint. To try to bring you to Jesus. Not going to do it. I'm not going to have some, some, some amazing gadget up here to, to make you understand how real it is. I'm not going to do it. We have He, the Holy Spirit, in this blessed book. But what I'm going to do is preach to you this. Jesus Christ came down from heaven. He is perfect because He is God. Jesus Christ in His life is perfect because He is God. He kept the law because we couldn't keep the law. He took upon Himself our sins on His shoulder. 
He kept that appointment with the cross. He died there. He didn't have to. At any point, he could have removed himself from that cross. Or as the Bible says, he could have called 10,000 angels, a legion of angels. But he stayed upon that cross. And what kept him on that cross is his great love for you and I. The blood that was poured out. People say he spilt blood. He didn't spill it. Spilling is an accident. I do it all the time. He poured his blood out on Calvary. He took that precious blood to heaven and he put it on the mercy seat so we could have life eternal only through Jesus Christ. Only through Jesus Christ. They buried him, and three days later, he rose from the dead. Him dying, being buried, and raised from the dead, that is called the gospel. And we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. My friends, today, there's no new way to heaven. There's no new door to go in. There's no new window cracked open that you can crawl in. There's only one door, and that door is Jesus Christ. Now, now listen to me. If you haven't accepted Jesus as your Savior today, please don't put it off any longer. Say, preacher, I really don't know what to do. Well, I'm telling you, you come forward this morning. Say, oh, I can't step out. Yes, you can. The Holy Spirit will help you. The Holy Spirit's urging you right now. Say, well, I don't hear a voice. Inside of you, you have that urging of wanting to know more about Jesus and His salvation. That's the Holy Spirit convicting you. Obey that conviction. When you come down this morning, we're going to open up the Bible and show you what the Bible says. We just got through doing a series of messages on the Bible, Way to Heaven. Just finished it last week. We're going to show you what the Bible says. Say, how do I know it's real? Because God is real. How do I know it's truth? Because God is truth. Maybe you're a young parent here today and you accept Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior. You just, Daddy, you just did your family the greatest favor you could ever do for them. Mama, You just did your family the greatest favor you could ever do for them. Because you can show them Jesus in your life. And they will accept him also. Say, preacher, let's just go to church. Let's just sing some songs. Let's just be happy and we'll walk away. No. No. If we have Jesus... Outside of our life and not in our heart, we can't just walk away. Because you've walked in empty and you're going to go out of here empty. We want you to go out of here with the joy bells ringing in your heart. That now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Say, but preacher, I can put it off. Please don't. You don't know what tomorrow holds. If Christ comes back, I don't care what the movie theater says. You're left behind. He shows us as it was in the days of Noah. When God shut the door, the door did not reopen. But it makes me feel good thinking that. It's not about what we feel. It's about what God does. Will you let Him come to be your Savior? Will you let Him be your God. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for these verses of encouragement, knowing, Lord, it's still your word. It's still your power that saves a soul. So many times we're hearing now that they write you completely out 
And they believe they can get to heaven any other way except through you. But help us understand there is no other way to heaven but by you. Lord, we know persecution may come on the church. But through persecution, we can see victory. Your word needs to be established. Your word needs to be be, uh, dug in into into our churches, to our lives. It's your word that we carry to a lost world. I pray that he, the Holy Spirit, will work in our hearts. That we will not push him away. Lord, we'll take that wooing spirit and accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. Help us as a church to be what we should be. In Jesus' name, amen. As we all-